Um, thanks everybody for joining us for this. I think it's the ninth of this series of uh, Triple ID Conversations. The idea is to have quite an informal time together, building community among people who do information design and, and, and related, uh, related things. And I'm really pleased uh, today we're going to move into the area of legal information design, which has been something that that I've become interested in over the last few years. And um, Stefania Passera is one of the one of the pioneers of this. Uh, originally a graphic designer, she'll explain herself what how she how she got into it. Um, and she's based uh, well, she's from Italy. She's based in Helsinki, and she's been uh, pioneering legal legal information design. Um, in association with the World Commerce and Contracting, which is the uh, large organization of many thousands of people in, in the world of, of, of business contracts. Um, she's also been an assistant professor at the University of Vasa in Finland, and she has a doctorate from Aalto University, uh, also in uh, Espo in um, near Helsinki. And um, so if I've missed anything out, uh, Stefania, would you like to just just carry on? Yes, <laughs> that's, that's very detail. nice. Thank you. Uh, I mean, these are all information you can find on the Internet. Just don't ask chat GPT, <laughs> because according <laughs> to chat GPT, I am a professor of computer science and I'm a UX expert. So <laughs> uh, close, close, but not cigar. So what is it that I do? Uh, it, if you ask me on a Monday or Thursday, I may give you different answers. My uh, my typical answer is that I'm a contract designer. Uh, I tend to say that because most of my clients ask me to redesign contracts. So this is a simple and difficult question at the same time, because at the same time, I may design privacy policies or procedures or guidelines about contracts or guidelines about other legal slash organizational stuff. So all those sort of documents, legal and or bureaucratic that are messy and you wouldn't want to deal with, that's what I deal with on a, on a daily basis. So at some point I say, okay, um, I've been talking about legal design. Uh, apparently I co-wrote um, manifest on legal design. I co-organize legal design gems. Should I just say that I'm a legal designer because it's more encompassing? Uh, and then I start thinking, but in what I do, do I really want to be legal? I'm actually trying to do what I do in spite or, of legal or considering the legal dimension as just one of the requirements, a very important requirements, yes, but it's not like I'm going to an engineer and an engineer says, I'm a natural law engineer because, you know, there are natural laws like gravity that impact my, my contracts. And I feel the same. The, the law is there. There are or legally tinged phenomena that, that touches on what I do. But for example, when I work with contracts, I don't want to, th the last thing I want to think about is legal. I want to think what contracts do for the people I'm designing for what those people are trying to do with contracts, uh, what those organizations are doing. So I'm having like my different personalities or my different interests having this um, infinite debate in my mind. So I, I still think that it's better still to just be a designer. What I do to me is design. It's not legal design or anything. It's, it's what I think an information designer should do. You throw very difficult information at them and they're gonna try to make sense of them and they're used and able to work in multidisciplinary teams and work with subject matter experts that may have very deep very specialistic very hard expertise like lawyers or uh, policy makers for example so how i ended up here um uh, I'll let Rob perhaps asking me to elaborate, but what I what happened is that many years ago I uh, I met Helena Hapio, who's here with us today, and she's been a big influence in in what I've been doing, and she's been the the one who made me think about the question like why no one is doing these things with contracts. This is information design. It's not rocket science. Why no one is doing it? So we started conjuring research and practice to figure out, okay, why is it not done? 
Is it a matter of feasibility? There are other boundaries. Is it that people just don't know? <laughs> Lawyers don't know that there's design. What is it? So along this path, I accidentally ended up writing a PhD that was something else that wasn't planned, like working with contracts. Uh, I guess that back then I just really didn't want to get fired from the university. Like You have no business staying here if you're not a researcher. So, well, I guess I'm a researcher now. Um, but still, the answer were, the, the core answer is like, why? Why are you simplifying contracts? This is, for example, the question that my dad asks and has asked over the years. My dad, for example, doesn't fully understand why I do what I do because he's very pessimistic about contracts. He thinks that contracts are written the way they are on purpose to trick people and exercise power over them. You may forgive us for thinking so. We are Italians. We're very suspicious about the institutions and the institutions are very suspicious about the citizen. It's an infinite mutual cycle of distrust because everyone is going to try to take advantage of someone else if you're in Italy. So we have this pessimistic vision about contract. And uh, even if you're not from Italy as a consumer, you can fully be excused for thinking so. This is your experience. This is a, um, an installation from uh, Dima Jarovinsky. He has printed out the terms of uh, popular social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and so on. And this is what, if you print them out on a 4 this is what they look like. So our experience as consumers, as ignoramuses, if we're not lawyers, is that companies are using contracts to cover their backs for everything. They're not writing contracts for us. And when the terms of condition of Microsoft are 15,000 words and they're just 1,000 words short of Macbeth, not reading contracts and agreeing without reading is the only rational choice left to the consumer. So uh, I, I like that um, consumer protection uh, authorities and policymakers are thinking that, yeah, humans, if you give them information, they're going to take uh, rational decisions in, best, in, their, in their best interest. But, you know, we are acting in a regime of bounded rationality. We have studies on studies on studies in psychology about that. So the only rational choice when there is a design that is aggressively designed to disincentivize use is not to read. That's the only rational choice. These are contracts that are not designed to be really read. I mean, many of you are designers. We talk about affordances. We talk about um, user journeys. Imagine that you are trying to park in front of this mall are you really going to read the terms and conditions of the parking in this size while you're driving? This is not designed to be really read. Once again, like this exists to serve only the interests of the of the company or the parking company that put it there. So one could say like contracts are designed like that because of malice. But then you start looking at business to business contracts contracts between businesses, commercial contracts. And that's where surprisingly I do most of my work. And you see the same contract, the same horrible contracts. And in this context, it makes no reason to be unclear. These are the typical pain points of my B2B clients. This is what my clients come to me and they're willing to pay me because they have these problems. Our sales team doesn't understand the contract. And they clog up the legal department because I have a million questions. Our suppliers don't understand, so they can't comply. Uh, we sign the agreement and then the implementation teams cannot implement them because they don't understand what it means. Our clients don't understand them, so they don't trust us or they tell us that we are too difficult to do business with. Uh, even when legal department also complains, oh yeah, they're picking up the phone for stupid things we are telling them every day. Uh, we put out guidance and they still don't use it because it's still too legal. So everyone wants effective uh, contracts in companies because they're wasting a busload of money, time and resources. They don't like that. And lack of clarity also exposes them to risk and risk is expensive. So why is this still happening? So I'm convinced that it's mostly a problem of the traditional way of looking at contracts. And Helena, as the person 
who has opened my eyes on this. They, she made me graduated from normal suspicious Italian to a proactive law thinker. <laughs> but uh, my design brain also thinks that is a problem of design illiteracy. It's the compound of these two. All style reactive lawyering, actually this is a conversation. So perhaps Helena can come on, on, uh, on screen and explain it better than I do. So. I'll try to be very short, but the old style reactive lawyering is like the lawyer you see in movies. They must protect from every possible risk. They must win in court. My client is innocent. And this gets multiplied by design illiteracy that people, lawyers, uh, office workers don't know what design does and they don't know where to put the hands to change things. So that's the classical design illiteracy of the office workers. There's, there can even be good intentions like in this contract, there's a contract I redesigned and say, hey, if we use font size 0.7 and three columns, the contract will be shorter. Sales told us that they want a shorter contract, but we cannot take away anything. So we make it shorter in this way. So that's design illiteracy. That's not bad intention. That's not malevolent, but they don't, clearly don't know where to put the hands. But in other ways possible, uh, there's a paradigm where lawyers and designers can be allied, and that's the paradigm of practicing lawyering. That, once again, if you're interested, ask Helena to come on screen. Um, a proactive lawyer is a, is, a, is a lawyer who says contracts don't make things happen, people do. And this makes the light bulb go ping immediately to designers, like, okay. We're talking about user tasks here. We're talking about affordances. We're talking about signifiers. Yeah, I understand this language. Yeah, words don't make things happen. You 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 have to um, to create affordances and scaffolds for behaviors. And these lawyers are allies of business. They prefer when their clients stay out of court. They prefer to keep their expertise. They use their expertise to keep the clients out of court and be allies of business and balance risk and reward. So they have happier clients. Their clients don't want to go to court. And when there is that mindset, then we can start talking about design. If you start talking about design to a traditional lawyer, it won't make any sense. You might as well talk about science fiction or fairies. It won't have any logic for them. It will be completely logical to spend your money and time designing contracts. But when you're a proactive lawyer, you understand that people needs to be helped. You understand that even, even lawyers are struggling with this information. No one wants, no one this day wants to read anymore this this complex information. So they start looking into design. They want to know, okay, what can design do? And some of them get training, for example. I mean, Rob can tell you there's many lawyers and contract specialists who attend his information design school. So they start knowing what to change and why. And if they're not that well-versed, they know at least how to work with designers and where to get extra help. And this is where things start changing for better outcomes. So I wanted to show you this before and after here between these two documents, because I also want to say like, this is not rocket science. This is very humble design, as I would say a lot of information design should be. It's not, I mean, my work is never gonna read a red dot award or anything like that, because really it's not rocket science and clients tend to be very, same, very traditionalist. For example, in this project for Ecovadis, yes, we use some visual, but it's like, yeah, well, we don't want diagrams. We don't want anything too wild. In the legal terms, don't put visuals and so on. What we worked in this document, um, in this project was mostly on information architecture. So, okay, what are the important things that we need to put up front and that we really need to simplify and you know, use business speak? So when you understand what the solution is and what the risk profile is, you can go and read the legal terms, but knowing, okay, what is the deal that we are doing here? And then you can read the technical details. And this seems very, uh, very banal, but one of their problems was that only one client in 10 wanted to start negotiations on the basis of their document because their document was horrible. They were saying this, and yeah, yeah. Nine clients on 10 throw our contract in the bin. 
And then they hit us back with a master service agreement of 200 pages that is not suited for selling our contract, but for selling our product. And it takes us this many months to negotiate it. So a lot of money, um, external legal fees, because maybe the client is in Japan and you don't know how to negotiate a contract in Japan and so on. So with just these changes and making sure that when the contract arrives to their lawyer's counterpart, they understand, oh, okay, this is basically a SaaS solution. You're, we're just paying and seeing this supplier scorecard to see how green the suppliers are, how ethical they are. Oh, maybe we can go a little bit easier then on the liabilities, on the indemnification and so on. Because uh, Also on personal data breach, because we're not giving personal data. Um, but they can start thinking about this if you reassure them, and the only way to reassure them is to explain them what the what the service is really about. And as I said, this seems banal, but from one in 10, they started having like five in 10 clients saying, okay, we can use your terms. When they use these terms, their negotiations are 50% shorter. They told us that, well, the first year that they used this contract was the COVID year and say, okay, if we wouldn't have had this contract, we would have really been... Uh, screwed in the US because that was our toughest market to penetrate. And instead we grew four times compared to the year before. And their VP of sales said, well, the annual benefit, if I if I look at what we have in Salesforce and everything, I think that the annual benefit of using this contract instead of the old one is two to $3 million. So that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, design can lead to shorter, cheaper, less confrontational negotiation. And that speaks dollars. That's important for, for these companies. So when we flip the script, when you think proactively from a legal perspective and bring in the design, you can start asking the right questions. Usually lawyers are very narrow on risk and legalities. If they're a bit more seasoned in house, they may look also at business, but it's still a quite narrow lens. When, when you get into that being a nosy designer mode, that, then is when you, that is the, really the core of what the designer is paid to do. You start asking about users and what do users do and what they don't understand and where do they make mistakes and what's the context uh, and what's the technical feasibility. Okay, I can make a perfect template, but then you're gonna use it in this way. So that is not a good solution for you and so on. And, and you start really tracing the right boundaries of what you should be doing with contracts. Number two, you start noticing that you may need skills, other skills to solve the problem. Uh, plain language and information design, visual communication, of course, but sometimes you have to understand about rhetorics, interaction design, framing, nudges. And of course you need to be able to work with the lawyers and understand when you really cannot cut short. Um, so you start seeking or developing criteria to guide the work. Uh, I have a sort of tweak, I have tweaked for, for my own work and still they work very well, the criteria that Rob uh, and the Simplification Center have developed for, for the criteria to create clear documents. Maybe how you decline in the particular, those criteria is a little bit different from for contrast, but it's not that different. I mean, it's the same. And ha but having criteria is good because it helps creating a common language shared by designers and contract specialists. It helps them to understand, okay, what can I improve? Where are the problems? What am I feeling? If I want to write more clearly to manage content more clearly, if I'm a baby contract designer, what, what should I do? And these things help them understand it in very simple principles. Something else that helps bridging the gap between uh, uh, designers and work and contract specialists or lawyers to work together is a design pattern approach. So bright patterns and not only dark patterns that are used for tricking consumers in giving out more data and money than what they want. And, you know, design patterns are uh, uh, documented techniques principle-based techniques with examples of how you apply it. If, if it's a component, you may even have, you may even have the component that you can grab. Um, not as in, in this pattern library, but what it does is that designers understand these techniques, for example, okay, a timeline, what's a timeline? What the pattern documentation does for them is to make them understand, okay, when do you use a 
timeline in contracts for what sort of problems. Contract specialists know the problems that they have and the task and the goals that they need to be uh, achieved. And how the pattern, the pattern documentation works is that it matches their problem to a robust solution. So it teaches them to think more as designers without being one. And on the other hand, instead it helps designers to enter into that context uh, better. That's why I'm, uh, I spend considerable time <laughs> curating this contract design pattern library and have been asking for, uh, Helena was at the beginning, she helped me found it, but then we went bothering Rob and many other people to expand this collection of techniques um, so that we could map as many techniques as possible as what people are really using. So since this should be a conversation I'll uh, I'll stop it here by ways of introduction to see what you want to ask or what you'd like to to talk about. I still have uh, some examples in my in the back of my pocket and I can take those out if you're interested. Um, or we can start a bit from your questions really. Um, thanks very much, Stefania. Why don't we? have a few questions now, although I forgot to say in my introduction, please put them into chat. So we haven't got any yet. Um, and then we perhaps come back to examples. If people have yeah. questions they'd like to ask now, has anybody got, um, got, got any questions? I was really interested in um, the return on investment you told us about for Eco, Eco Vardis. Um, it's, it's always something of a surprise, I think, for clients of information design. And I don't think information design has really realized just how much they can save their clients. You know, so, yeah. so most, most designers um, are employed to make things look cool or look nice and possibly you know, brand things or sell things. But actually, information designers can save their clients millions mm -hmm. simply by making things more effective, things run more smoothly. And I think yeah, your and PhD had data in it, didn't it, Stefania? It didn't have data on, on money, really. I was trying to, um, to demonstrate much easier things at the time because, you know, if you're a designer, you probably know that certain things work, but good luck explaining it to the lawyers and the business people. So I, I've always been joking that my, uh, my PhD has been the longest uh, marketing pitch in history because it took me five five years to have the data to go and have a nice uh, nice pitch. But what is it that I discovered? Of course, you have to be narrow when when you start testing things. So, for example, say okay, I'm not gonna go down the plain language path. We know that that works. There's other people have worked there. I just want to concentrate on the effect of visualizations in contracts. So, if I Take legalese, so without changing legalese, but I start adding diagrams, for example, to explain certain clauses. And I change the layout, so I create a visual hierarchy. So at least the information is a bit more skimmable. You start getting, okay, this is a heading and this is a paragraph instead of being a wall of text. What happens? And what happens that then when you give comprehension tasks to people, like, realistic comprehension task like okay this situation has happened while you're implementing the contract um what can you do or uh, your client said that they're going to do this can they do it or do you have the right to do this uh, by when do you have to exercise this right so very practical ways to implement in contract not do you understand this word because people then are just going to parrot i wanted to say like do you understand it and can you apply it so I would give them these sort of questions. And then I would say that people were actually able to find the information, the right information more quickly and their answers more and more correct. And even with uh, World CC members, so contract managers, when they got in the test, because it was an A-B test, when we did that study with them, people who got the traditional contract and it was the first time that they saw that contract, they got only 60% answers right i would have Im imagined experts would get much more and there was a significant effect there was a significantly magnitude um uh, or, or, or order of magnitude bigger effect that when you give them even these diagrams together with the text people understand better 
Um, then I started running different different uh, different um, control variables and say, okay, let's control for learning styles. Maybe someone is more of a verbalizer, someone is more of a visualizer. Does it that you have an effect? No, it doesn't have an effect. Uh, could it be that I don't know lawyers? Uh, uh, suddenly, I have all the lawyers in this group, so that's why they're better. No, it's not that. Um, an interesting thing was about native speakers and non-native speakers in the, and here I did like um, ANOVA, so you do a within group comparison. And if you compared within the original, the, the people using the original contract, both uh, the non-native speakers were obviously much less accurate in giving the answers than the native speakers. But when you went in the other group, in the ones using the visual contract, they, they were at the same level and both were much more accurate. So I said, okay, um, this is quite, you know, your research, they always ask you for managerial implications. Like, well, this is a managerial implication because our, um, my potential clients, like people who are picking up the phone or writing me an email, like, okay, I read, I read this paper. Uh, how do we implement it in our organization? Usually they're doing deals in English and sometimes it's an Italian company building a power plant in Brazil and dealing with the Brazilians and they use English and they use terrible English. I, I have some of these documents on my desk. Um, never mind. Uh, but yeah, uh, the English is a lingua franca. So we need really a pragmatic model of language. And to me, uh, using design in addition to language helps communication to be pragmatic. That's really interesting. Um, now we've got some questions coming in. Um, there's two people, uh, Emma, Emily and Dominique, are asking about your process. So what are the steps that you go through and who do you involve in the uh, in the client's business? So it depends uh, on the project. Um, uh, sometimes it comes from the legal department. So there, there are some illuminated uh, legal department that says, OK, we want to do this project. We want to, I don't know improve our contract or we want to improve this contract for this business line because we have such and such and such problems. Sometimes it's business, sometimes it's business like, hey, we are having 18 months negotiations on this master service agreement. It's, it's, and they're money people. So it's costing us a lot of money. It, it can't be possible that we can't do better than this. So usually these are the main two poles. Then of course, in privacy policies, there may be uh, DP, like data protection officer or the privacy team that decides to do something. In uh, internal guidance, it may be the contract management function that sometimes sits within or between legal and business or it's cross-functional and so on. Um, and I tend to work mostly with, uh, with businesses, not with law firms. So, uh, it's the people who are suffering from contracts at the source that come directly to me. And uh, how it works, like usually, um, once again, the, the process is not rocket science. Okay, so let's see the contract first. Let's, let's start evaluating, okay, what is the contract? And let's start asking questions, even before making the proposal, like, okay, why do you want to do this project? What, what, where are you bleeding? Where, where do you feel the pain? Um, are there, you know, even starting from, you know, like war stories, like what are the things that people are always complaining about? You're imagining a different future, what that future is. I also ask them, do you have metrics? Do you have a baseline? And most of cases, they don't have a baseline because legal departments don't measure or, you know, they may have uh, uh, metrics on volumes of contracts or by sector, but very often they don't have metrics that measure value of what they do. Like, okay, how many hours it takes us to review this contract and how much does that cost? Sometimes they don't have that, so they have to make a guesstimate. And uh, that's where we start. Let's say that, the, okay, we are convinced that this can help us. Um, depending on the project, because it's still very difficult to sell user research in this field. It's slightly easier if we are doing consumer facing contracts because they have heard from other colleagues that yeah, we go to talk to, to customers, but in business to business, if there's a part of the budget that they want to save it's like, oh, no, let's, it is the first time we do a project. So maybe next time, maybe if we're doing more improvements because we are sure that anything you would do, it's probably better than what we have now. 
and they don't have a baseline anyway. So, um, and you know, they're buying this thing for for this first time. They want to make it as easy as possible. So, okay, fine. The good thing, and I, I don't want to sound like a heretic or I don't want to sound um, arrogant. The good thing is that 80% of the problems in these organizations are always the same. So even if I go and do research, I'm mostly hearing the same things. <laughs> and even if you go out and do research on a contract, for example, even with consumers, the first thing they say, I don't really read them. I don't really have an opinion because I don't really read them. So sometimes it's almost easier to first create different concepts to use as probes. And then you start doing the research and like, okay, play around with this privacy policy. Okay, now play around with this different one. What do you think? Uh, then the good stuff starts coming out because suddenly they form an opinion. It's like, okay, all of these look very different from the typical stuff that I don't read. Uh, you got me on a test, so I can't run anywhere. So I'm going to play around with that and I can give you feedback. And, and then th there's interesting thing coming out. For example, uh, I can show you now one example. So wh why we decided to have this sort of design for the terms of this startup? Because the terms that they had before were just a big mix up of terms that applied only for people that had the personal account and people that had the business account, so business or consumers. And this is a very simple contract, but uh, this is a pattern that we had learned. And we noticed that they liked this pattern because it was the same pattern that won in a, another project that I can't disclose, but it was for a bank. That people like when you have this sort of menu of the topics, because they say, I cannot negotiate this contract. So I feel that at least I have a sense of control, that I can at least read the things that interest me in the direction I want, follow pressing here or pressing here, doing what I want. So I have at least that little margin of freedom. And that came out also with the other in the other projects, surprisingly. If you would give them things that say, like, okay, maybe this thing is fidgety and so clickety clickety. Let's just give them something easier that they can scroll. They don't like that. It's like, yeah, it looks nice, but I like this one. I want to read what I want to read. So uh, that, uh, that was a discovery. And it was interesting that in two different, okay, the, the, the fil rouge was that they were both consumer terms, but you know, by length, complexity, type of organization were very, very different things. When you start shortening contracts, then you can start having this sort of nudges. I'm going to tell you that this document it takes four minutes to read so I, i'm trying to to get you to read I, I i don't want you to click without reading and this is where i can show you the other privacy uh, privacy policy uh, i don't manage i haven't managed to convince any client yet but i'm trying to say like please in the project can we try to you know when we are looking for example at some checkout or some process to find ways that hey you know that behaviorally nudge you to into read those terms of service or privacy policy because people are not going to click so they don't even know if you have a, a better document if you have redesigned okay i didn't manage to do it what we managed to do is at least okay if i click here instead of being hit in in the face by a wall of text i have a model that tells me okay this is the summary of the privacy policy here, there's the first invitation, read the full policy, no legalities, we promise, so that's one door in. Instead of having read more, read more, or, ha or having just this one big button, I put you questions in your own voice, like the types of data we collect. Okay, tell me why. They, they all send you to the uh, to the full privacy policy. How we use your data, yeah, how exactly. Uh, third party is the problem, what do they do, and so on. So it's all trying to like, okay, you have questions and I'm trying to get you there so you can get those answers. And, and this is how the privacy policy, um, okay, now they changed it a bit. It, it's how it looks like. Um, we are trying to use accordions or at least some sort of layering. So we just give you a bit more details than that model, but then you can read more so we can give you more explanations or Okay, what's the legal basis? So what's the legal reason why you can use this data? If I don't know what it is, once again, it opens up the tab here and it tells you what this legal basis mean or so on. 
or imagine if you're a privacy geek and you really want to look into who are the third parties or cookies, bam, we're really listing them all. There's the link to their privacy policy. Of course, I'm not going to put this when you come here because you're going to run away. Look how long it is. But in case you have the appetite for it, you, you can press and open. Some people look into those things. Well, if there's a sub supply, they're going to look into those yeah. things. Stefani, there's a couple of other questions. I just want to uh, yeah. bring into bring into into the conversation. Um, I guess there's so two or three which are to do with persuading, working with clients uh, and being radical. You, you mentioned uh, so Emily mentions uh, talks about the conservative approach you took with Icavadis. How often is it that you put forward an approach knowing it would be amazing, but the client shuts it down as they don't see visual as being appropriate? And then uh, Ralitsa is asking, how do you persuade people to take risk and try something new? In uh, my experience, legal and comms people tend to be very risk averse. And then related to that, Martin Martin Cutts is, is saying, you know, if, a, if somebody comes to me, a bank or an insurer mm -hmm. with a 5,000 word contract, uh, and Martin's a plain, a plain language expert, how can, he can rewrite it and restructure it, but finds it difficult to sell them the idea of using an information designer. So how, how th these are all sort of wrapped up in client mm. relations. How do you persuade yeah. people to use designers and to, and to be more radical? Yeah, that's, that's, a, um, that's interesting. I, I mean, I'm a, in a, I'm in an <laughs> enviable position or, or maybe I'm in a stupid position. And I don't know, but uh, all my business is by word of mouth. I don't actively cold call clients. I don't do pitches for free. I prefer to use my work in, in, in doing the work for clients. So it's very rare for me to have the chance, oh, I want to bring this client off board and I have to jump through hoops to, to convince them because they, they come to me. So that's an enviable position. Of course, if I would want to grow my business more, I would need to start to do that. And that's one of the key reasons why I'm, the, I'm not growing my business more because I want to design and I don't want to be a business developer or just having pitches. Um, how do I persuade people to take risk in something new? Sometimes having examples, uh, like the example of Ecovadis, the uh, Ecovadis people also made a video in which the head of legal department, um, uh, the head of sales, give their testimonials and say like, okay, these are the numbers. This is how it's solved our life. They were so happy about it that they wanted to make a, a small video with us. Um, so I would say that I don't get that many people that, okay, I want to try this approach, but I'm very, very prevented <laughs> from trying it. Sometimes, yeah, they, they may say, okay, but maybe no pictures on this thing. and. You know, sometimes it may be a valid concern because it's a heavily negotiated agreement. And when you think of users, you need to think also of the internal users, not only the end readers. If the person like editing and preparing the template into the real contract has to spend a bazillion hours doing that or word explode and word styles explode in their face and they don't know how to tweak the visuals, I haven't done a good job. So there is very little ego. I said, I, I'm, not, I'm never going to win design awards with the work I do because I have very little ego. I said, okay, you think, you know, it's your company, it's your business, it's your risk profile. I can tell you what I think would be good. And I'm going to show you the jazzier examples I have, but ultimately it's up to you. Plain language. There's legalese, there's plain language. You're not comfortable going with the you and we. You're not comfortable in doing certain things. But let's eliminate at least this sort of thing. Let, let's try to at least, I don't know, improve it by 50%. So sometimes it's a journey. And I think it's a privilege when a, when a client tries this thing with you for the first time, because that project often becomes the first of many. Um, That's so, how you convince them. There are many people come back after they see it once. Now that, that relates very much to Martin's follow-up question he's just posted, which is basically where can he find good examples of uh, examples of good practice that he can show clients and demonstrate what good designers can do? You and can I, I want to prompt you to, to, to think about the 
the pattern library because your pattern library has a lot of examples yeah. in it, doesn't it? That would have been my answer because a lot Sorry, of the work yeah. you do on contracts is uh, is confidential. But here there are some examples. You're not going to see a full contract, but you're going to see for each pattern that is documented, there's many bits. And I think it's enough to convince like, okay, there's many companies that are doing this and arguably it's not like all their legal departments have gone completely crazy. Um, you know, Shell is doing this thing. Rob, you have worked with them. The, the, the metrics were quite similar, 50% shorter. Uh, negotiation that were 50% shorter. And if it's two or three million for a um, for EcoBodies, that is a medium, smallish company, I I I think that the the figure, the annual figure of money said, for example, for a big one like Shell, it's uh, many orders of magnitude bigger. So yeah, you, you can start from the contract design pattern library. Then there are there may be some other examples. I think Martin's, there, if you look at um, website about of other consumer, people working on these sorry. things, yeah. I think Martin's probably talking about consumer contracts as well. I, I mean, Martin, do feel free to you know to to speak up. And, yeah. I, I think you're still muted, actually. I think, uh, uh, Martin. Um, you, no, it's the audio that is not working. It is not mute. Okay. Something's wrong. I'm sorry, you need to type. We can't, we can't hear you, Martin. I'm sorry. Don't know why. Okay, that, that's another thing that, to, in my experience, is much easier to convince business to business people who have a problem on the business to business side than than business to consumer organizations. Because in business to consumer organization, you have to be a bit illuminated or seeing beyond your nose. Because consumer organization, consumer facing organization, organization already have all the power. Yeah, they may be losing something, but what is it that they're losing? Okay, demonstrate me that I can make more money with better contracts. Why should I risk it? I'm very comfortable here. But business to business clients are not comfortable where they are. One thing you mentioned, the work for Shell, and you and I worked together on some of the, the very early work mm. for them. Um, what we did there is something I've done a few times, and I think it sometimes works. This is answering the question about how you persuade people to try something uh, that they think is risky, and um, which is that you can show them things which are more risky than the one you really recommend. In other words, one that's really off the scale. And then it's rather like choosing the second wine, second most expensive wine in the list. Uh, the restaurant can sort of move you up by making the most expensive wine even more you're expensive. using dark patterns rob yeah, it's a, it's a dark, <laughs> you're nudging them you're dark manipulating pattern. them so so yeah it's like like a free <laughs> pro and enterprise our best chosen option yeah that's yeah. what you do so, i mean an example <laughs> of this with 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 the plain language work for shell was that we we gave them some examples of their legalese translated and one of them was to turn quite a big paragraph, which was basically asking a question, are we liable for something, 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 something? We translated that into no. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and this was kind of, the, you know, that was the takeaway you needed. No, you're not liable for whatever it was that was very complicated to explain. Um, and that was too much, but it did. It, it it definitely was a dark pattern that nudged them towards towards plain language. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you don't if you don't know where what you want, that, that's what I say. Like you should make small prototypes. You know, just as probes. Even the the first time you're showing, I don't know, layouts or how you're gonna treat certain parts. You can say, okay, we can do it like this, or we can do it like that. And especially with clients that you don't know exactly what they're after is good to like show samples in advance. Um, a project I'm currently working on is a master service agreement of 120 pages, uh, procurement side. So very, very cautious. And uh, before we start, I said, look, okay, give us three weeks before we do the kickoff with you. We're gonna take a, some some excerpts from different parts, some parts very legalese, some more commercial. And we're gonna create samples, a sort of moderate middle of the way. And you can tell us if that is okay, 
if we have to dial it back even less or do you want us to mo go more radical? Another thing we, we did to basically make us say yes or yes, but go more radical is to, was to be, bring them metrics. We have used, for example, this uh, startup platform called TIGIM, T-I-G-I-M. Uh, basically gives you different, um, different many different metrics on language. It's like a language analytics. So it tells you how many word, what, what's the percentage of words longer than 20 words? What is the percentage of word, of um, sentences longer than 30 words? Passives. Uh, sentences where you have more than one issue, left heavy sentences and so on. So there's many, many different indicators. So you can go to them and maybe choose the indicators where you look better. So like, look, for example, what we did is like, okay, now we, we are the first draft, end of the first draft, and we are still using these tricks. So that we told them like, using moderate simplification, we cut away from this part, 4,000 words, and that's 22% of what you had in this part. Let's look at the statistics. We managed to basically improve on all, you had all, all I don't know, 94% of your sentences were flagged as difficult sentences. And now it's only down to 50. And now let's open up the six criteria that this software uses that flags. And let's see what, what has improved with those. So at the moment we are doing a, a trial with this with this software, but it seems to me that, for example, using this sort of analytics could be quite useful in proposal making. And then at the beginning, I mean, you, I, I can with this software, for example, you can set your own standards of where you want to be. So you can have a small workshop with the client as part of kickoff and say, okay, do you want the language to be where? Where do we dial the formality and against which we're going to benchmark then the work that we make? Or when they ask you to do a proposal, you can go back and say, okay, you have 80% uh, passive verbs. Uh, it reads a C2 level, uh, like these sort of things that I know that metrics don't mean much, but, but, um, Stephanie, but clients love those. <laughs> it's, it's a pity we don't have that for, for, for design, do we? That, that's like, that's yeah. the language. A um, couple of other things. One is... Um, just want to, uh, Heloisa asked a question a while back, um, saying, asking whether the data, the money saving data from Ecovardis is available publicly somewhere. In other words, is it something, and this relates a little bit to Martin Cutts' question. Mm. Uh, he wants to persuade people that, that it's better. Now with, with consumer contracts, you can find relatively mm. simple ones and, and certain places, but what you don't have is the data you know, you don't know what effect that's had, mm. having fewer disputes with consumers. With business contracts, um, can people quote what you've just said? Um, you, you, I don't have a public reference for that. I mean, they, they were okay with us to make the video and they're happy that I well, used it go. in the presentation so people, and so on. But there's not like an book. article where... Yeah. Yeah, oh, wait, I'm... no, there, maybe I have it in an article. I have to check. I, I think yeah. there may be an article where, where we have used those, those figures and they were okay with it. It's That'd probably be behind. Um, I can send it later. I, I can find okay. it. Um, I think question. we have one article where, where we went on record. Great. That's fantastic. Um, another, also from Louisa, is a, a process question. Um, I suspect I know the answer, but when you say we, is it the royal we? Because we no, no, it's not a royal we. Uh, it's so, so an you, actual we. One, your... one of the we is here. Francesco Brand is one of the we, and she's yeah. online. Um, the what, we it... ranges, yeah, um, at all time between, let's say. No, what what is the professional background? So, what sort of people do you work work with? So, on the team, there's um, plain language editors, uh, lawyers. Sometimes, often we have lawyers that we are working with in some projects, it may be the legal department, but in that case, you know, th they know that they have to do their work. Yeah. Um, and we work a bit more. Um, user research. So I do user research. One of the editors that is working with us is also a UX researcher. So um, sometimes we're sharing the, the hats even. Mm -hmm. um, there's a visual design information and information architecture. 
So Francesca, who works uh, who works often with me, is a, is a visual designer. Uh, I tend to do more the part of concept and information architecture because I'm very nerdy and I like to put things in boxes. I almost have more fun putting things in boxes than designing icons at some point. When I arrive to the point that, yeah, we need an icon there, my job is done and I'm really happy with that realization. <laughs> And then Francesca creates very beautiful and clear icons, for example, when we need icons or diagrams and so on. So at any at any point, we are usually two to five people on this. What we never do uh, is the development for clients. So for example, if they want to do contract automation on a certain platform, we don't do that. If they want their privacy policy on a, on a website, we give them the prototypes in Figma or whatever that is and documentation and their website people put their hands on their website. We don't do that. That's where we, we hand it off. But that is really with contracts and, and, and documentation. If you're doing different types of projects, you may want to have, uh, you know, you may want to create more interactive things. For example, if you're designing guidance and if you start designing guidance for compliance, perhaps you want to also design how you're going to train people or how you're going to test people about what you teach them. So uh, that has not worked. I have been doing, but I see how it can go that way. Um, slightly related question from a while back. Uh, Thomas Miles uh, asked about your the tools that you use. Do you use InDesign? Um, <laughs> is there something else that you might use? And, and how do you hand things over to, to the... I am laughing because I have very bad news for you. You gotta use Word. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and PowerPoint. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. If some charts are very complex, you make or or icons, you make them in Design uh, or Illustrator and drag them in. But it's very very rare, unless it's a static prototype for something else. Have you ever done uh, uh, what I do, which is to work in InDesign because it's quicker and then translate it into Word at the last minute before delivery? Uh, no, because now I'm so used to working in Word that I'm faster to do it straight away into okay. Word because I know the things that are not going to work and the work yeah, yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. So I start directly into Word. I try to set those blasted multi-level lists immediately, um, the styles immediately. So When you were showing us, was it Juro? Um, mm. was privacy policy, was it? Whatever yeah. it was. Um no, yeah, this one is not done in yeah. Word. <laughs> you made no, but you made the point at some point. You said, "Oh, I think they've changed it. It wasn't quite yeah. what you were expecting." So when you when you hand things over to clients in Word, they then have to maintain it, don't they? Yeah, they, they do. They need any changes? How does that go? How does that well, work? I I don't know to be honest. Sometimes you notice then they're like, "Oh, we tried to create a new contract based on." few of the other documents you have done and we can't do it. But I mean, the layout is okay, but the content and the organizations are a mess. So it is more than design. Like they need someone like, no, okay, no. This thing, it shouldn't be here. It should be there. They need Marie Kondo, essentially. <laughs> they need someone who tidies up nasty things for them. And uh, unless they're also willing, okay, we do this project, but at the same time, we train you they're going to have that problem. So I think that the, let's say the evolution curve on this is that you, you do a project. If the client is smart, they're going to come back for a few more project projects. At some point, they're going to realize, hey, but we want to have all the documents like this and we can't keep on paying you to do it one document at a time. Can you create documentations and can you train us? And I think that with some clients, I'm starting to entering into that. Like, can you also train us or can you make guidelines? And then we try and then we're going to cry. And then we are going to ask you to train us. Okay. You, know, you need to, it's like with children, you have to repeat things at least eight times or 16 times. <laughs> I don't remember before they really grasp the concept. Right. So that's why I'm like, I'm, I'm not feeling desperate or I'm not like, oh, why clients don't understand? Like, given time they're gonna come back they're gonna realize it maybe not today maybe not in two years at some point if you work Fantastic. with them they're yeah. gonna realize it. so we've come to we've kind of come to the end of our time now um one or two people are having to messages they're having to go 
So I think we're time to wrap up. So um, I want to say a big thank you, Stefania, for a fantastic talk, giving us so much insight into what you do, why you do it, and how successful it is. It's, uh, it's all brilliant. It's really great to see uh, information design you know, in action in a way that, 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 that makes businesses more effective and makes, makes life better for everybody. So thanks very much indeed. I don't know how we applaud, but um, I'm going to just clap because my microphone's on. <laughs> but uh, so that's, that's great. And then just a couple of closing remarks as well. I just want to congratulate David Sless for being with us because uh, before you came on, David, uh, we were talking about where everybody is in the world. Someone in, in Hello Wizard in Brazil and Dominique, I think, in Canada. And I said, well, uh, David registered, but I don't think he's going to join us. He's in Australia. It's probably three in the morning, but you're here. So that's brilliant. Um, and I just want to give a plug for the next talk, which uh, actually Carol Vandervada, who's with us today, is going to give on the 6th of April at the same time. Carol, do you know what you're going to talk about yet? Can you say something about it? Am I putting it, you on the spot? Absolutely about the, the medical world and how patients receive information about their medicines. Um, there's lots of things happening with the new European regulations. Um, and we need to figure out how... Uh, how it will affect people. Right. So that's the next one. That's on the 6th of April. And I also want to give another plug for the simplification uh, for the information on summer school. A lot of people here have been on the summer school. I can see from your names. And uh, it's it's going to be face to face three days in Vienna just before the Vision Plus conference on, on health information design. And it's the 22nd to the 24th of May. And uh, we're going to run a Q&A online for anybody who's interested in in in, in joining um, between now and then. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. I think I might have frozen. Am I still on the I don't know. You're, you're fine. You're moving <laughs> and you're talking. My screen's frozen. <laughs> thanks a okay. lot. See you soon. Uh, thanks, thanks. To Bye. thanks everybody Bye -bye. for joining us. Thanks See for having soon. me. Bye. Bye.